Good evening. I'm Dr. Bonnie Gregory. I'm a fellowship trained orthopedic surgeon specializing in sports medicine. Tonight, I'll be talking about common elbow injuries in the young athlete with an emphasis on overhead or throwing athletes. First, we'll talk a little bit about the elbow in general, the types of injuries that happen in the elbow, the anatomy, the biomechanics of the throwing motion, as well as some specific injuries um, that we are concerned most about in our younger throwers. So youth athletics are huge in our country. As many other speakers in this series have noted, youth sports are incredibly popular with about 35 million children and adolescents participating in organized sports annually. Unfortunately, greater than three and a half million kids are also injured during sports activities each year. Of the two million plus baseball players in the US, about 20 to 40% of the pre-adolescent and about 50 to 70% of the adolescent baseball players will experience some degree of elbow injury during their time of play. And this, these injuries have gone up precipitously over the past few decades. Um, not only have the injuries gone up, but the treatments have as well. So ulnar collateral ligament reconstruction or Tommy John surgery has increased tenfold over the past few decades. Additionally, some studies in older um, baseball players and professionals and collegiate athletes have shown that uh, by the time these players reach their early to mid-20s, they've developed significant changes in the anatomy uh, of the elbow, often requiring surgery and demonstrating that long-standing uh, overuse injuries have taken place. But of course, the elbow is, on, is not only important in our overhead throwers, it's also important in other overhead athletes such as swimmers, volleyball players, gymnasts, uh, tennis players, and even golfers. So why is the elbow at such risk during the throwing motion? Well, during the throwing motion, the elbow sees a significant valgus force. And what is valgus force? It basically means the uh, forces or during the overhead or throwing motion are concentrated on the medial aspect of the elbow. Um, and that is particularly prone to uh, injuries during the throwing motion. Um, most of these injuries are in fact overuse injuries which by definition are microtraumatic damage to the bone, muscles, or tendons uh, that is subjected to these repetitive stressors or repetitive throws or overhead uh, movements without sufficient time to heal. And in fact, uh, of elbow injuries that baseball players report, 97% of those are, are on the medial aspect or the inside aspect of the elbow. So understanding a little bit about the elbow anatomy is important because uh, it kind of helps us understand why the elbow is at such risk during the overhead throwing motion. So a little bit about the osseous or bony anatomy. There are three bones that make up the elbow joint, the arm bone, which is called the humerus, and then the two forearm bones, the radius and ulna. And in general, these bones do provide significant stability to the elbow, uh, with 50% of it just being by the bony uh, congruence or matching of those bones uh, during the throwing motion. But the other 50% is provided by soft tissue structures, the most important of which is, is the ulnar collateral ligament, or UCL. And we'll spend some time talking about um, this ligament today. It's also important to understand the throwing motion for why the elbow is so important for our overhead throwers. So there are five main stages of the throwing motion. The first stage is the wind up. And in that stage, the elbow is flexed, the forearm is slightly pronated or palms down. The second stage is the early cocking phase when the ball begins to kind of come out of the non-dominant hand and uh, ends when the front foot kind of contacts the ground. And the shoulder at that point is kind of abducted, which is brought away from the body and externally rotated or, or kind of arm behind you. Um, stage three is the late cocking phase. And it's that, that phase where you see kind of the biggest torque, at least visually on the elbow with the, the ball being the most posterior furthest away from the body behind it um, during the entire throwing motion. Um, the elbow at this point is kind of bent to about 90 or 120 degrees, depending on the type of thrower or the thrower. And then the forearm is increasingly pronated, uh, which is kind of palms down. <clears throat> Stage four, the acceleration phase, is uh, when kind of the, the elbow sees the most forces because that's, that's where we're kind of swinging through the throwing motion and put the most stress on the medial side of the elbow. Um, it's there's kind of significant acceleration that happens in the elbow for our professionals. They see 
you know, 600,000 degrees per second squared, which is incredibly uh, high torque and acceleration through the elbow. Um, and this is, the, this is the phase of throwing that puts that UCL or the medial aspect of the elbow most at risk for injury. And then stage four is the follow through, um, which is kind of the phase in which we dissipate all the energy or get rid of all that energy that the throwing motion has built up. The ball is released and kind of the body has to absorb and kind of maintain those forces and kind of get rid of them uh, to go back to the resting state. So a little bit more about this valgus stress at the elbow. So over time during repeated throwing motions that UCL or, or medial aspect of the elbow sees chronic um, kind of small little micro tears or micro injuries. Um, and, and this is kind of increased depending on the rest of the biomechanical um, status of that athlete. So if we potentially don't have a strong core or our shoulder girdle or shoulder muscles are not as strong as they should be, instead of appropriately using those other parts of the kinetic chain, athletes kind of ask that their arm or the more importantly, their elbow be, um, be able to dissipate or, or uh, create all of those forces for a strong, uh, fast throwing motion. And of course, um, when when forces are, dis are, are kind of concentrated in one small area, that small area is most at risk of kind of getting injured or getting um, kind of trauma over time. So over time, you know, with, without adequate rest or without adequate kind of strengthening of the muscles around the elbow, shoulder, core, uh, hips even, uh, that UCL is at particular risk of, of getting damaged. So how do we evaluate these athletes? So um, oftentimes these are, as I mentioned, chronic overuse injuries, but occasionally they can be acute injury. Occasionally uh, an athlete will come in and saying, you know, come in saying, wow, I was pitching on, um, you know, the sixth inning and I felt a pop and a immediate pain on the inside of my elbow. And I even got some tingling in my fingers, you know, and since then it's kind of been swollen. It's bruised in the area. Um, of course, you know, all, all of us are concerned when that happens, and usually those acute injuries seek, seek care pretty quickly because, um, you know, most of us know when there's bruising, there's a pop, there's swelling, uh, we need to be seen quickly. Um, and then kind of that numbness or tingling in the finger can happen because the ul ulnar nerve or the funny bone nerve lives right next to that ulnar collateral ligament. So if we injure it acutely, um, that nerve can get irritated as well. Uh, the, the more common way that these players present is um, kind of vague, increasing medial or inside of the elbow pain, or even more commonly, loss of control, loss of velocity over time, uh, which is a pretty good indicator that we're getting these chronic overuse or UCL attenuation injuries. Um, you know, players may not have the most pain or they may just think that pain is normal during the throwing motion and don't really make anything of it. And they often wind up in our offices when they've noticed like, wow, I, you know, I've dropped 10 miles per hour off my pitch or my control just sucks. And, you know, I don't know what's going on. And that's when we'll kind of find these more chronic overuse tears or injuries. So once you make it to my office, what do you expect? So like any good orthopedic surgeon, we get x-rays pretty routinely to look at the bones. The bones are kind of, um, you know, like our lab markers. You go to your primary care doctor, they draw blood. You come to the orthopedic surgeon, they get x-rays. Uh, that allows us to not only see if there's a bony injury, but in our younger athletes, it also allows us to tell the status of the growth plates in the elbow, which can be important for the types of injuries that happen. So, you know, first expect some x-rays to, to be taken. Second, a physical exam. And the physical exam is really looking at um, how the how the elbow's moving, how it responds to different stresses and tests that we put on it, which kind of help us narrow down what problem we think is going on. Um, additionally, if, if your surgeon is concerned about a UCL injury or another uh, certain kinds of growth plate injuries or cartilage injuries, um, we may order an MRI, which is an advanced imaging um, plus or minus with some little dye injected into the joint to make it uh, a little bit easier for us to see some of those smaller soft tissue structures or see any problems in the cartilage and things like that. So say we diagnose a, a UCL sprain in a younger athlete. So what do we do first? First off, non-operative treatment is the gold standard, especially in these young athletes. We try two to four weeks of full rest, meaning no throwing, 
know anything. Sure, you can work out your legs, do core stuff, but nothing with that upper extremity with, with some anti-inflammatories. So your ibuprofen, Aleve, Motrin, things like that. And then the mainstay for me here is really good physical therapy because often in our younger athletes, there's a reason that that medial elbow or inside of the elbow is seeing so much more stress. And it's often the result of either shoulder weakness or problems in how the shoulder is moving, core weakness, or actually hip and trunk weakness as well can, can lead into that elbow being at risk of injury. So having really good physical therapy with somebody who understands baseball, understands the throwing motion and the mechanics is really the key here to getting over these UCL injuries uh, in a non-operative way, meaning us not having to operate in your body, kind of responding and healing that area. Um, we do not recommend uh, steroid injections routinely in younger athletes. One, um, it doesn't do anything to aid in the healing. Steroids are kind of anti-inflammatories, which can help with pain. Uh, but they don't actually help ligaments heal. So I don't routinely use those in, in my patients. As I mentioned, kind of the mainstay for me um, is kind of physical therapy and working on strengthening and flexibility of, of kind of the joints above and below, as well as the core in general. So, um, you know, the first few months we're working on physical therapy after we've done our appropriate rest. And then by about month three is when we start to return to a supervised throwing program. So um, kind of in a stepwise fashion, working up through distances, reps, um, until we're kind of throwing at a, from the mound, you know, a, you know, a month to two later. So it's not a, at a it's kind of a gradual ramp up back to full activity so that we don't wind up back in that position where the elbow is at risk again. And when we start this early, so when we see um, an athlete early and are able to diagnose this and, and treat them, uh, half the time we're able to kind of solve this with, um, with physical therapy and, um, players are able to get to their pre-injury level of throwing uh, somewhat quickly without having to go through a surgery and a prolonged rehabilitation that surgery entails. So early diagnosis and treatment is absolutely the key here for our younger athletes. So even if you've just started to experience those medial elbow symptoms, it is worthwhile often to come in and get seen so that we can correct any, any problems you may have in your throwing motion or any other, um, any other aspects of your your kind of body mechanics or muscular balance that may uh, prevent this from coming a long term long term problem for you. So if you do happen to have uh, a, you know either an acute UCL tear or a UCL tear that is not responding to non operative management, so we've tried months of this and we've tried resting and therapy and gradual return to play and it's not working. Operative treatment may be indicated. And what is that operative treatment there? Um, there are kind of two main operative treatments that can happen. One is a direct repair of the UCL. And this usually is for acute um, avulsions or, or um, when the ligament pulls off the bone. Um, and, you know, occasionally for those mid-substance tears when they're acute. Oftentimes the repair is not possible because, as I mentioned, these these injuries are often overuse injuries, which means that, that um, ligament over time becomes tendinotic or scarred and is no longer a great ligament that we'd like to repair back and instead for those those players and athletes we, we proceed with with what is called a owner collateral ligament or ucl reconstruction which is better known as a tommy john surgery and doing that um we kind of use either a tendon from another part of the body so either um, one in the forearm or one from the hamstring tendon from from the athlete or we use a cadaver graft to kind of reconstruct the ligament on the inside of the elbow. As I mentioned, this has a, a bit longer of a rehabilitation process. We do put the athlete in an immobilized position for seven to 10 days after surgery. And then we start progressing with active motion. We start kind of strengthening the wrist and forearm at about four to six weeks. We don't start strengthening the elbow to six weeks. Um, we really avoid any valgus or that stress on the inside of the elbow for a full four months. And then we start to kind of gradually get back into strengthening motions and full return to sport is not for about 12 to 18 months after surgery. So um, as I mentioned before, if we're able to diagnose these early and treat them, even though four to six months sounds like a long time, it's much better than 12 to 18 months for recovery, especially for our young athletes who have considerations for college ball or 
or um, kind of advanced training uh, or advanced career options. We like to get them back as safely and as quickly as possible. So there's another thing that can happen in our in even younger athletes or so athletes who still have open growth plates in the elbow, which is kind of like the cousin to the UCL injury. And that's called little leaguer's elbow. And what that is, is um, instead of injuring the ligament on the inside, instead of injuring the UCL, uh, we injured the growth plate or the apophysis where that uh, UCL inserts. And that's called the medial epicondyle. And the same thing happens. So chronic overuse, chronic kind of pulling on that attachment uh, of the ligament on the inside of the elbow can force that growth plate or that um, medial uh, epicondyle apophysis to kind of pull away as it's the weak point in the system. Uh, in our growing athletes, their ligaments are actually in, um, ligaments and tendons are actually stronger than the growth plates or the bones themselves. So oftentimes this is a spot that um, that can be injured in our younger athletes. So once again, risk factors for this, skeletally immature patients, so the growth plates are still open, poor throwing mechanics. So if we have a breakdown in our throwing motion and we're putting too much stress through the elbow, um, shorter shoulder and core weakness, as I mentioned before, and then overuse in general. I'll talk a little bit more about kind of some other risk factors, including too many pitches per game, too many innings per week, um, poor mechanics of the throw. And also there's some, some literature that shows introducing breaking balls, um, throwing breaking balls at a younger age can put the elbow at risk. So we try and avoid certain types of pitches in our younger athletes while the growth plates are still open. And similar type of thing happens when you come in for evaluation of this. Well, um, you know, we'll examine the elbow, we'll get some x-rays. Um, we will kind of examine occasionally with an MRI if we need to. Um, and then we kind of start this process of rest followed by with anti-inflammatories followed by physical therapy and a gradual return to throw. Um, occasionally though, these uh, growth plate injuries are so significant or so displaced, meaning the growth plate has pulled away from the rest of the bone, um, that these do go on to need surgical uh, fixation as well. And, and that is typically, um, you know, when they've displaced more than about four millimeters, uh, we go in and kind of fix that with a screw um, to hold it there and allow it to heal in pay place. So how do we prevent this from happening? It's great if we can catch it, but how do we prevent it in general? So a lot of um, what's been shown in the literature is actually looking at pitch limiting, so limiting pitch counts, uh, as well as having a true off season. So um, we've shown that if, if players pitch for more than eight months in any given year, they have a five times risk of elbow surgery or if they pitch over 80 pitches per game, they have a four times risk of elbow surgery. So those are significant uh, numbers that that oftentimes our younger baseball players are playing year round. And, and it's easy to understand how they may put themselves at risk for these overuse injuries when they're playing school ball, club ball, and really treating it as a 12 season sport, especially down here in Texas where weather is so great that you can really get out and play uh, any month of the year. So other types of things that we consider are the pitch type. I mentioned a little bit before, um, you know, the different types of pitches have different forces that happen in the shoulder and elbow and, and have different risk levels for injury. So fastballs and sliders do have the greatest forces on the shoulder and elbow, uh, but curveball actually has the highest valgus stress um, and actually it puts you a little bit more at risk of shoulder pain in addition to elbow pain. The changeup is a little bit safer than either the curveball or the fastball from a, a structural and anatomic perspective. And then the spitter and slider are the ones that we really want to avoid in our younger pre-adolescent athletes as they increase the uh, risk of elbow pain by 85% in those 9 to 12 year old athletes. So um, kind of the USA baseball guidelines have come out that say avoid fastballs before the age of eight, change up before the age of 10, curveball four by 14, knuckleball at 15, and then those sliders, forkball, spitters, screwballs, all wait until you know the player is 16 or fully skeletally mature and hopefully um, kind of in better neuromuscular control of their uh, arm. Additionally, limiting pitches to nine months per year uh, and that in those three months that we're not pitching that we avoid all overhead activities. So it's not just you know, stop pitching and then go into swimming or playing a racket sport as those those sports also have the same um, kind of stress on the elbow and don't really count as rest from an elbow perspective.
So um, what else do we recommend? So if an, if a pitcher feels elbow pain during during a pitching motion or during a game, they should be removed immediately from that game and not put back in. As oftentimes um, that can be the first kind of episode of a major injury or it can be an acute tear. And we really like to keep those players out so that they're not making matters worse. Um, additionally, kind of any pitchers under the age of 13, um, they, after pitching for four innings, they should really be taking at least three days off before pitching again. And in our older patients, um, kind of, they can go up to five innings uh, in a game before needing to take a couple days off. And, and it's other also important to note, especially for our little leaguers who don't have position players for everything, that, you know, when taking time off from pitching, these players really shouldn't go play catcher either because a lot of the same long ball throws can, um, even though it's not the pitching motion, can still put the elbow at risk. So thank you so much for your time and attention today. Um, if you have any questions for me, feel free to comment in the comment section below. I'll um, respond to them uh, as I can. And then if you have any further questions, feel free to um, kind of email our group or visit my website shown above or, of course, follow me on social media. Um, and thank you so much for your time and attention.